This is After Immunity, a UMFM limited series that aims to explore the questions surrounding what our individual and collective worlds will look like after we've gained immunity to COVID-19. Join me, Ian T.D. Thompson, as we explore five topics to understand the post-COVID-19 world. On today's episode, we are looking at the urban environment after immunity. Join us as we talk to Professor Shauna Braille, Associate Professor at the Institute for Management and Innovation at the University of Toronto, and Benjamin Gillies, a research fellow at the MIT Urban Mobility Lab and downtown Winnipeg entrepreneur. Throughout this pandemic, I have lived in cities, first in Toronto, then Winnipeg. Like many Canadians, over the past year, I've witnessed firsthand how vibrant urban environments changed overnight because of the pandemic. Previously bustling areas like Bay Street and the Entertainment District have been at points mere ghosts of their former selves. The Bell MTS Centre was a vibrant magnet for citizens and small businesses alike, now a lone barn for the Winnipeg Jets. Canadians live and work overwhelmingly in urban areas, and as such, these areas have generated significant wealth for the country. Yet the pandemic, like many other aspects, altered the functionality of life, work, and the urban environment. First, there has been an exodus from the city centers. Due to pandemic restrictions and the subsequent workplace changes, people left cities, finding salvation in the suburbs and smaller towns. For instance, Statistics Canada showed how Montreal and Toronto saw a loss of people from July 2019 to 2020 during the pandemic, while areas like Oshawa and Kitchener-Waterloo saw an increase. The use of public transit services, such as buses, subways, and streetcars, has declined during this time. For instance, at the start of the pandemic in April, nationwide there was an 84% drop in transit use compared to the previous year. While there has been an uptick in use since, a study by Moody Investor Services estimated that for transit systems in Vancouver, New York, and France, transit ridership will drop permanently by 20%. Faced with declining ridership and the subsequent decline in revenues, concern has been raised over the financial sustainability of transport agencies and their ability to provide vital services, particularly to low-income groups. Downtown businesses and services have also been challenged by this exodus. Once flushed with a regular customer base due to proximity with workplaces, many businesses have had to pivot to new economic models to reach customers, or close their doors. In Winnipeg, at least 37 downtown businesses have shut down since the start of the pandemic. Governments have been aware of the challenges faced in Canada's urban environment during this time, with various programs set up to help municipalities, transit services, and small businesses. Yet, this is a growing story, and many questions about the future remain uncertain. How will Canada's urban environments evolve in a post-COVID-19 world? What will be the role of public transport in that future? Will its objectives change or be reprioritized? Additionally, how might workplaces and businesses change in the long term because of the pandemic? Understanding the many facets to this conversation, we explore this question first through the lens of mobility and urban transport. Earlier this year, we had the opportunity to chat with Professor Shauna Braille. Shauna Braille is an associate professor at the Institute for Management and Innovation at the University of Toronto and is a senior associate at the Innovation Policy Lab in the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. She is also an economic geographer and urban planner, and her research focuses on the transformation of cities as a result of economic, social, and cultural change. Shauna, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Ian. Thank you for the invitation. So I guess a good place to kind of get us in the right direction would be just to kind of understand the components of an urban transport system. You're the expert in this. What are some of the components that make up a successful urban transport system? You know, that's a, it's a great starting point because we don't always think about, you know, how it is we get around in the places that we live and how we travel to meet both our sort of daily needs, how we get to work, how we get 
to healthcare appointments, meet with friends, et cetera. But mobility, the way in which we move from one place to another is a critical sort of piece of life, regardless of where one lives. In a city, the components that make up the transportation system are things that are, you know, we have to think about multimodal, how many different modes of transportation are available to people to get around. The vast majority of Canadians are people who drive in private automobiles. We've done some work looking at, you know, the proportion of trips taken by private automobile to work in Canadian cities. And overall, in most cities, it's well over 60%. In Edmonton and Calgary, they are the car driving capitals of Canada. It's much closer to 80% of trips to work uh, are in private automobiles. But we also have other ways of getting around that are really, really important to facilitating both equitable access to transportation thinking about affordability, thinking about people with mobility challenges, but also thinking about active transportation. How do we encourage people to use their own power, walking, cycling, to get around? Public transportation systems are a really key piece of a urban transportation system because they do a number of things. One, they allow for many people to travel to the same location. So I'm thinking, you know, the trip from home to work, especially if there's a bit of a distance there, where we have a lot of people working in sort of dense environments in workplaces, perhaps living a little more sort of, you know, dispersed lower density. In order to get all of those people from home to work, a public transportation system really helps remove congestion from the roads. It helps speed up the trip to work. And it also helps facilitate other kinds of environmental benefits as well. You know, we also in in most cities, most Canadian cities, all Canadian cities, I think, have public transportation systems that include buses, right? Buses are essentially, you know, they are been described as the workhorses of public transportation systems. They actually are what drives the system to enable a sort of a network approach, right? So whereas we might have one or two or three subway lines, we might have, you know, a hundred bus routes or more. Mm -hmm. And those bus routes are really critical to reaching out to neighborhoods, to bringing people to where they need to go. That's a really helpful place to start in talking about the different components, different ways that people get from point A to point B. So obviously with the series, we are talking about the pandemic and how it's kind of affected that urban transport system. But I think a helpful place to kind of frame us with this is understanding pre-pandemic. How were transit services such as the buses, such as the public access system, how were they doing all before this? How would you kind of characterize transit systems before the pandemic and their various issues? There's a lot of evidence from cities around the world that ridership in large systems has been declining. In part, this is a result of a lack of investment. So if your transportation systems are breaking down, if they're unreliable, if they're overcrowded, this is a disincentive for users who have a choice whether or not to ride on public transportation. And so when there's choice and money is what buys that choice for the money and a well, money essentially buys that choice. There, is a, there were real risks around loss of ridership because of infrastructural kinds of challenges. The other piece in here is around thinking about, again, transit systems in cities across Canada, looking at patterns of growth and change and population growth. And in Canada, you know, while we have great concentration of the population in a relatively small number of metropolitan areas, what we also have is the spread of that population, the dispersal of that population to more suburban areas, which means that the way the sort of efficiency and effectiveness of public transportation that can serve low density neighborhoods is very different from serving higher density neighborhoods. And so we really have to think about how do we match public transit services with land use Mm. activities and land use plans. So on the one hand, There was and there is a renewed an emphasis on creating denser neighborhoods so that they can be better served by things like public transit, which has a lot of benefits. But then also thinking about 
how do we actually encourage people living in lower density neighborhoods to use public transit? So do we test out an autonomous shuttle service? Do we look at different sizes of buses? Like not every neighborhood requires the same large bus. Maybe we have some minivans. Maybe we have smaller shuttles. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the other thing that was going on in, um, you know, that cities were starting to test out were thinking about instead of fixed routes for transit, on-demand routes, right, which is essentially the ability by using technology and a piece of software that prospective sort of bus rider, a prospective transit user says, I'm starting here and I'm going here and using an algorithm and it's software very similar to ride hailing software matches up different buses with passengers and takes them around on the route, which technically can be faster and more efficient and serve more people than having fixed routes. Mm -hmm. So all of these were were things that cities across the country have been experimenting with. That's interesting to kind of get that pre-pandemic perspective of some of the issues that cities were facing, especially in the last couple of months, you're hearing stories that are rather consistent in terms of now they're just been, issues have been kind of exacerbated. And the one aspect that, that you drew upon was kind of the lack of investment in some of these transit systems. And of course, the decline in ridership. And one of the stories you heard, especially on the onset of the pandemic, has been that significant decline in ridership and the subsequent kind of declines in revenue for cities because of that ridership. How would you characterize the shifts we've seen in terms of transportation throughout this pandemic? Um, has, Has the pandemic essentially just exacerbated issues that were already kind of at the forefront before the pandemic? There are a lot of issues that the pandemic and a lot of problems (laughs) that it has exacerbated. But when we look at mobility in particular, and here's a case where we see the need for new sources of data. And, you know, I sort of started to talk about this and like what was happening pre-pandemic and how are we using data and the opportunity for sort of smartphone and app and algorithms to route bus passengers. But we have to think about how technology and the collection of data has helped us understand the impacts of the pandemic on cities and on transportation in particular. And so I think one of the positive things to come out of our responses to the pandemic is the ability to look at new kinds of data and the release of data that shows mobility patterns. And when we look at that data, whether it's, you know, Apple mobility data or Google mobility data or Move It, which is a routing firm for transit trips, and they collect data for city, all of these collect data for cities around the world. When we look at, you know, the time of lockdown in sort of March 2020, we see all mobility, walking, driving, transit. Imagine a cliff, it just falls right down that cliff. And so I, I I am looking right now at a diagram of this on this dashboard that I've been working on called Toronto after the first wave. But you can look at any city around the world, whenever their first lockdown started, boom, it just goes straight down. Everything goes down at once. The thing that goes down the most, though, is transit. Transit falls the most. And what happens then is both walking and driving pick up a lot more quickly and return to near pre-pandemic levels or even exceed pre-pandemic levels. But in Mm -hmm. almost every city around the world, and, and in I think all cities in Canada, transit use continues to be far lower than it was before. It is not recovering. It is, you know, it has not recovered. It is a very slow recovery. If you look, for instance, this week at TTC data on the percentage of uh, mode use compared to pre-COVID levels, subways are at 20%. That means Mm -hmm. it's down by 80%. Streetcars, 23%. And buses, 38% compared to pre-COVID levels. So everything is very significantly down. This is expensive and it's it's a problem that we're going to face moving into not just the immediate future, but a, a much sort of longer future because of the ways in which municipalities rely on transit revenues, transit fares to both cover the cost of providing transit, but also as a really key service that these municipalities, you know, need and want to provide. The other piece I would say that's a real challenge here, I mean, it's wonderful that walking and active transportation is up. It's less wonderful that driving is up. Driving is up because people feel safer 
in automobiles, right? They feel safer. We're worried about physical proximity. So you're in a car by yourself. You don't have to sit next to anybody. You don't have to breathe anybody else's aerosols. But the more cars we have on streets, the more we have greater congestion, the more we have greater emissions, the more we have more accidents or crashes, and the more likely it is that people will be less likely to return to transit. And we've seen this in all around the world where we've seen the sort of return to activity. So we knew this was coming. When we, we could look at data, I have a survey from that came out of China, about city in China, about intention to purchase a vehicle back in April. 2020, intention to purchase a vehicle back in April 2020, as Chinese cities were emerging from their very extreme lockdowns, was way through the roof. And then just this past summer, the story started to come out, what's happening in New York City, where there is very low levels mm -hmm. of car ownership. Car ownership rates have skyrocketed. Intention to purchase a vehicle has skyrocketed. And you know what? The big problem is no one can find a parking spot uh, because there aren't parking spots for that number of cars. And that's sort of the structure of the city and the focus on sort of a walkable, dense area. But this challenge between the increase in driving and the really dramatic reductions in transit is something that's going to stay with us for a while unless we direct it to a better future. Yeah, yeah. That, that's fascinating to see just the real time this is what's happening. So insofar as that goes, so you talked about this in the terms of the short term, you know, these people are more interested in buying cars, public transit services are down and they seem to be, you know, the growth rates are still at a very low level. Is that something we're still going to see in the long term in this post COVID-19 world? Will people still be apprehensive about being or taking part in public transit systems if they're kind of underfunded? Yes, <laughs> we, this, this is not a problem that's going to go away by itself. A study came out in a, uh, recently in a journal where they looked at the case of some Dutch cities and you know how could they bring riders back to public transportation systems. And the finding focused on building trust. And in order to build trust, you need to think about, you know, what kinds of short-term changes do you make in your transportation systems, right? So we've started that, you know, we require masks, we've increased the number of cleanings, we've changed sort of the capacity on buses and on subways, right? We've reduced the capacity. But mm -hmm. in addition to the need to build trust, there's still a need to continue to invest because if, you know, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy, if we say, well, 80% of subway riders are not on the subway. We don't need to invest in this subway. We can run our subways just, you know, less frequently, or we can run our buses less frequently, or we can get rid of these routes mm -hmm. because they're not serving any people. And as soon as you do that, you provide another incentive for people to look for a different mode of transportation, but you also take away an opportunity for people who have no other choice to be able to move around. And so you're exacerbating not just mobility challenges, but all kinds of other issues around ability to earn an income, to go to work, to socialize. And so from an equity perspective, things will get a lot worse if we don't continue to invest in public transportation services. I'm really glad that you mentioned that point, just because that's something that I think is an important element to public transit, is the fact that this is an essential service for a number of folks in the community, older adults, those in low income that do need to get to work. From what I'm gathering from this, it sounds like we still need to invest to ensure that it's reaching those populations. But how might you see on our current trajectory, I guess, how might you see the changes we're seeing in the transit service delivery model affect these populations? And how might that kind of change in the post COVID-19 world? I want to take one step back first to say that one of the things that has to happen is our changes to the funding model for public transportation. And right now, the greatest burden for funding public transportation falls on municipalities. And throughout the pandemic with ridership down yet with the notion that this is critical to providing and that it's an essential service for so many who without it could not function in society, could not manage, could not participate. We've seen 
at least temporarily, efforts to help municipalities sort of bridge this challenging time with funds coming, with more funds coming from both the provinces and the federal government. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, and it looks like that's going to be critical going into not just the near term future, but a longer term future Mm -hmm. that we need to really rethink the funding models. And I say this now because this is part of thinking about public transportation as an essential service and thinking about the role of all levels of government in funding quality of life and opportunity and access to participation for all people, you know, for everybody in Canada. But I think your main question was trying to get at, you know, what are the challenges from an equity perspective? Precisely. Right? Yes. So, and I talked a little bit about the role of data in helping to inform policy changes, service changes during the pandemic. So data plays a big role here in understanding, for instance, how to reprioritize service on different bus routes mm-hmm. during the pandemic. So collecting data about the number of riders and users on different bus routes and understanding, for instance, where frontline workers live within a city and understanding where they're traveling to, what their travel patterns are, means that it's possible for public transit agencies to look at this information and to say, okay, we have very low ridership in this area here because maybe this is a neighborhood where there are more people who are able to work from home and we have much higher ridership in this neighborhood here. And this is happening in cities. And so we need to increase service levels in this neighborhood to make riding transit safe. Mm -hmm. And we can decrease a little bit here. But we've also seen, I mean, I know there are some U.S. cities where they've just started cutting back completely transit routes. And this means, one, that there could we could see either people pulling back from participation in the labor force, right? If you can't get to where you need to go, or making decisions about labor force participation that don't enable them the greatest opportunity, but that allow them to stay where they are. Or we could see people moving in order to be able to access the kinds of services they want, which is then going to put pressure on rents. And so it really is, it it is cyclical, you know, whether and where we have transit services really connects to where people can live, whether they can participate in the labor force, whether they are isolated or not. And that's aside from the issue of, do we trust public transportation right now enough to get on the bus? Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the role that data has in kind of seeing forth and improving urban transport systems. And and in my view, that kind of falls under the larger umbrella of innovation as a whole. And you previously talked about how COVID, it's it's a chance to kind of re-envision what cities can look like, as well as where we want them to go. And data is just one part of this. When I think of urban transport, I think of all of these things in the headlines in terms of electric vehicles, automated vehicles, expansion of, say, bike lanes, rapid transit transit systems in some of these larger cities. But then here comes COVID. And so so my question is, where does the future lie for these very bold, innovative transitions for urban transport systems? Well, it's a billion dollar question, I would say. <laughs> you know, at some level, when COVID hit, the narrative was there's no space now for platform firms, for instance, for ride hailing, right? As mobility mm-hmm. fell off a cliff, nobody got into a ride hailing vehicle, just like almost nobody got onto transit at that time. But what we've seen is that the flexibility and the ability to pivot some of these activities, as well as the ability to take advantage of the kind of technological opportunity. So for instance, you know, we're seeing uh, more efforts and, and more innovation in autonomous, robotic driven picking in grocery stores and in warehouses, right? Mm-hmm. And that's going to at some point translate onto, onto our streets too, right? So is there more effort in thinking about autonomous delivery? of goods. I would say that there is, that we're starting to see a lot more discussion about things like autonomous cargo Mm -hmm. delivery, Mm -hmm. right? And on the one hand, you might be thinking, well, this doesn't have to do with how people get around, but it does. Because every time an item is delivered autonomously, it means a person isn't going out to get that item. The other piece around sort of the role of technology and the role of these kinds of innovations, well, you know, we're still seeing progress in electric vehicles. We've seen, you know, throughout the pandemic, the transit agencies that were shifting to electric have continued that Mm -hmm. shift. What I think we need to see more of is thinking about 
how to sort of leverage or repurpose transit funds and transit activities to serve shifting priorities and shifting needs in cities. So right now, 30, 40, 50% of people who live in cities, depending on the city and the number of those working in positions where work can be conducted from home, we're seeing a lot more activity at the neighborhood level as opposed to movement across the city. And so what are the opportunities for thinking through how do we promote and encourage new ways of getting around in neighborhoods, right? Now, some of that doesn't have to be technology-based, right? Some of that is around improving pedestrian infrastructure and accelerating the development of bike lanes and bike programs, you know, bringing in more e-bikes, for instance, into some of the public bike systems, uh, which allows people to go further, perhaps, or allows for people who otherwise couldn't cycle a distance or up a hill or whatever it might be to be able to use an e-bike. There is an opportunity to help people shift modes. I mean, currently, when we talk about cycling, we're looking, you know, if we look at a city, at any Canadian city, even with a strong <laughs> a strong cycling uh, network, we're still only looking at small single digits really in terms of total proportion of trips in the city region. And so this is an opportunity to think about how do we shift behavior? What kinds of things do we invest in? Are mm -hmm. there regulations that need to be updated at the municipal level? You know, do we want delivery robots bringing people food instead of having people go out to get them, right? There's, I mean, there's also been a huge kind of growth in food delivery, mm -hmm. right? Because at least in Ontario, our, our restaurants have been closed to indoor and outdoor dining for several months now. And so the only way to purchase a meal from a restaurant is to either pick it up yourself or have it delivered. And so we should be thinking about the role of sort of logistics and delivery networks in our cities as well. From the sounds of it, and correct me if I'm wrong, it kind of sounds like, you know, the innovation of automation, automated vehicles, a little bit of the digital ride hailing will kind of start from this idea of the food service delivery. And then maybe would you say that it would move into other aspects of our service delivery models of other goods and services? I think there is a huge opportunity to learn from what's been happening in food service delivery during the pandemic and to build on some of that in ways that are positive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another aspect that you mentioned was a little bit of, of having transport services take into account neighborhoods a little bit more. And throughout this pandemic, another angle of this is the future of work and a little bit of the exodus of city dwellers. And so it's, again, that change of how we work, where we work, and in some cases, the change of office culture as a whole. And so people are increasing remote work. It's shifting commuting patterns. So how might you think that this shift in the future of work, how might that shape Canadian transport systems and how they are designed? First off, I'll just say that we know cities are going to change permanently as a result of, you know, changes that we've undergone through the pandemic and one of the most notable of these is this shift in the success of working from home mm -hmm. uh, and the ability to be productive from home and employee satisfaction. But what we, it's too soon to say how permanent these shifts will be. There's some sense that at least a portion of it will be permanent, but increasingly I'm hearing firms saying, firms who were saying our employees can work from home for as long as they want are now saying, actually, there's going to be a requirement to be in the office mm. X percent of time. And we don't know what that time is yet. So I'm concerned that a lot of this discussion is premature. And yet at the same time, it's really important to plan for a variety of scenarios so that we are prepared. So when we think about, you know, what does this mean at the neighborhood level and what does this mean citywide? And particularly in terms of transportation, I do think that neighborhoods and municipalities as places of many neighborhoods need to think about local infrastructure perhaps a lot more than they had before to really think about the quality of public realm and public space and streets are public space, right? So 30% of our cities are comprised of streets. How can we use those streets differently, better, right? How do we, you know, think about improving the sidewalk space, but creating space for bikes, creating programs where bikes are available for those who don't own one or for those who just want to borrow one for a short period of time? Do we take away some of the neighborhood street space and devote it to other uses, whether they're commercial or non-commercial uses? And then how do we think about 
you know, mobility in a neighborhood that's equitable and that provides sort of accessibility for people at a range of life cycle stages and at a range of income levels. And so I think it's, it's partly a mobility question, but it's even more importantly, a public realm question, because we have seen that our outside spaces have been the sort of the salvation, the savior during this time. And so we've sort of developed a new appreciation for the outdoors. And maybe then that means we need to think about how to shape the outdoors differently, including, you know, reusing some of the spaces that are devoted to private automobiles. And how do we reshape those spaces to make sure that they are accommodating of far more uses and activities? Yeah, that's a really interesting kind of frame to think about this question, because I think you look at the headlines, there's all these stories about how Main Street's dead, you know, this is the death of the city center. But what you're saying, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it sounds like, you know, more companies are saying we need to kind of embrace a little bit more of that office culture and, and getting back to the old normal, I guess you could say. But that's fascinating in terms of just thinking about this in terms of a land use question. How do we adequately take into account, you know, as you said, people have to go to parks, they want to go to parks just to kind of get some fresh air and how that's kind of incorporated into the question. I want to ask just in terms of keeping with this idea of the downtown area and the impact that it has on specific stakeholders, specific groups. And one element of this is kind of the small business owner, the small medium enterprises and how they fit into the the equation. How might you see those small businesses surviving or transforming in the post COVID-19 world based on kind of what we're saying in terms of innovations? This has been, by all accounts, a hugely challenging time for small businesses in particular, because they don't often have the resources needed to weather out such an enduring storm. You know, so what we've seen is there are a few ways that small businesses have been able to make the transition to really just survival mode during the pandemic. And I think that that includes really three things. One is embrace digital, right? For anyone who didn't have a digital presence before, there are lots of sort of turnkey solutions, both offered at the neighborhood level, right? By business improvement areas, by sort of other sort of business, small business focused organizations that help businesses go digital quickly. The second piece is to embrace the space in front of a small business, right? So whether it's a strip mall or a sort of street facing, main street facing business thinking about, and this involves communication again with an association, but also with the municipality around how do we get to benefit from some of the space in front of us? Can we use the sidewalk? Can we use part of the street for a pop-up, et cetera? And then the third piece is really around collaboration with others in the neighborhood, right? It's Mm -hmm. around building rapport. It's around building community at the neighborhood level. And if you think about it, we've seen a lot of initiatives, again, across the country around focusing on building up support for local businesses, you know, aside from the other sort of financial supports, the rent supports around driving sort of customers and clientele to smaller businesses and to bringing people together into neighborhoods, into these both digital storefronts, but bricks and mortar storefronts in ways that are safe, but also in ways that help to ensure the sustainability of streets that are home to, you know, small retailers and, you know, restaurants, cafes. These are the life of our of our cities are the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Shauna, this has been an incredibly valuable conversation. You've you've provided just some very innovative ways to think about you know, the future of our urban transport systems and what are the angles we should think about when we're thinking about urban transport in the the post-COVID-19 world. Do you have any concluding thoughts on Canada's urban transport system, the future of work after immunization in the post-COVID-19 world? Again, I've said this already, but it's a time of just terrific uncertainty and not terrific in a good way. And what I would say is that we need to prepare for the world we want, not the world we're going to get if we just let things happen. That in order to be able to come out, able to sort of build back 
better, but to create a society and a city and a set of spaces that do what we need them to do, that get people where we need them to go, that prioritize, you know, sustainability and equity and prosperity for everyone. We need to really be direct and intentional about how we prioritize and how we invest for the future. We can't just let it happen. Shauna, thank you so much for your time. I've gotten a lot out of this conversation. I'm sure our listeners will as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. You settled down. You found someone you care about and you moved out of town. Got a place in some say. That was Marin with the aptly titled track, Stasis in the City. Welcome back to After Immunity, a limited series that explores our questions surrounding the post-COVID-19 world. Today, we are examining the urban environment after immunity. Shauna raised some useful ideas in thinking about the urban environment after immunity the need to build greater trust and to invest in public transit to bring riders back and safeguard equity in the system, the importance of data in informing and reprioritizing transit services, and learning from and building upon innovations seen during the pandemic, such as the development of food service delivery models. I was also struck by some of Shauna's thoughts on the pandemic's impact on small businesses, Indeed, this has been a hugely challenging time with businesses in survival mode. As noted on the onset, in Winnipeg, at least 37 downtown businesses have shut down since the start of the pandemic. This pattern is certainly not unique to Winnipeg. Recognizing some of Shauna's ideas about businesses embracing digital and collaborations in the neighborhood, how will downtown businesses evolve in the post-COVID-19 world? Additionally, what may be in store for them down the road and how they deliver services such as through that food service delivery model. To give a greater on the ground perspective on some of these questions about the urban environment is Ben Gillies. Ben Gillies is a research fellow at the MIT Urban Mobility Lab. He is also a co-founder and the executive director of the Winnipeg Trolley Company, which provides transportation and sightseeing around Winnipeg's urban center, as well as co-founder of the Fools and Horses Coffee Company, which has locations around the city center. Ben, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I guess a good place to kick us off here would be just to kind of get a sense of the businesses you run and and the various entrepreneurships. Can you describe to listeners the services the Winnipeg Trolley Company and Fools and Horses provide and how these ventures kind of came to fruition? Absolutely. So uh, the first one, uh, the Winnipeg Trolley Company, we do provide a couple of different services. Our real bread and butter activity is our public tours. So we have general city sightseeing tours, as well as ghost tours and then beer tours or brewery tours. So we run those during sort of the spring through fall seasons. And then our vehicles, they kind of look like, you know, old timey streetcars from about the 1920s here in Winnipeg. So they mm-hmm. do kind of stand out. They're pretty fun. They're pretty large as well. And so we do also make those available for charter transportation. So doing things like weddings, birthdays, conferences, convention, all of that sort of thing. And then on the Fools and Horses coffee front, those are uh, coffee shops. And so sort of as you might find in, in many cities, we have four locations in the city. And really, so for the Winnipeg Trolley Company, when I founded that company, it was because of the fact that I am very much into urbanism. I'm very much into preserving built history and understanding the history and really the culture of cities. Mm-hmm. And I realized here in my hometown of Winnipeg that back in the back of sort of around 2010, I just finished university and had a lot of opportunities to work in tourism elsewhere and realized that Winnipeg really didn't have any public sightseeing tours of its really focused, especially on the downtown, but sort of in the broader city as well. And so 
I found a business partner and we sort of decided let's jump in and, and try and start this. And so we we're very fortunate that it's gone quite well over the years. And then for Fools and Horses, so similarly, being a passionate lover of urbanism and creating great urban spaces, I was given the opportunity to be one of five investors in Fools and Horses Coffee Company. And for me, trying to create these great third spaces, so a third space being not your work, not your home, but a great third space for you to sort of mm -hmm. get together with friends and family, or just hang out and study or spend time on your own, that was really appealing to me. And so uh, we launched our first one in 2014, and we've since expanded as well. And so I've been very fortunate that that's also gone quite uh, successfully. That's really helpful just to provide the listeners as well as myself, just a bit of sense of how these ventures, uh, and they really just sound like passions and they really sound like a real desire to improve Winnipeg and to show off the qualities that Winnipeg has as a quite important city in Canada, I might say. So you're talking about the success of these ventures. And I was just curious, you know, so obviously we're in the midst of a pandemic now, but pre-pandemic with the four locations of Fools and Horses and the trolley company, as a business owner, what were the challenges that you were facing before? before the pandemic hit? For the Winnipeg Trolley Company, I think sort of similar to just tourism in general in Winnipeg, it's, so my, my passion is transportation, so perhaps I'm biased, but I think that one of Winnipeg's biggest tourism challenges is its location and the lack of sort of accessibility to us as a city. Because of course, lots of other cities in North America either have large population centers themselves or else within two, three, four hours drive, you have millions of people who are accessible and so they can easily go to spend mm -hmm a weekend in Toronto, for instance, or Boston or wherever the place may be. Winnipeg, however, I mean, our population is relatively small. And then in addition to that, and perhaps even more importantly, is the fact that there aren't a lot of people in the surrounding area that you really start to go to places like Minneapolis, where you're really driving for a full day just to, to get there. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's really our challenge. And um, certainly being in the tourism industry, I actually love talking to people who've come from elsewhere because they'll say, you know, I really wasn't sure what there is to see in Winnipeg, but oh man, there is so much that you have here. So it's not, it's not that we lack great attractions, it's not that we lack uh, great things to see and do here in our city, but it is sort of not accessible. So that's a challenge for us as a company. And it's, like I said, certainly not unique to our business, but it does mean that we really have to think very hard about our local market. And we're fortunate that we're new enough that, you know, all 750,000 Winnipeggers have not taken our tour yet. So there's still lots of room to grow. <laughs> But then when thinking about the local market, you have to convince people that the place that they have lived their entire lives is worth seeing. And I don't think that's a unique challenge to Winnipeg either. But if you live in a place, so often you can be sort of a victim of thinking, well, I, I know this place already. It's my home. Mm -hmm. And certainly in many areas that is true. But there's a lot about Winnipeg. There's a lot about any city that we can still, even if we've lived there, our entire lives can learn. And so just sort of convincing people that it's worthwhile is a bit of a challenge. But as we mature as a business, it does get easier. And then for the Fools and Horses coffee shops, I mean, sort of similar to any restaurant or food service, the margins are not the best in the other world in terms of profit margins, and then really just driving foot traffic. So always trying to stay relevant, thinking what's sort of on trend, how can we design our spaces in an appealing way? How can we remind people that we are the local place to go for coffee and that they, you know, want to keep walking by the Starbucks or what have you and uh, keep coming down to us. And so coming up with great drink ideas, food ideas, ensuring that we have fantastic customer service. And sort of as we grow and expand, I mean, when you're just one location, it's fairly easy. You can be very much, you know, have lots of great touch points with your staff. But as you grow and expand, how do you ensure that the same great customer service, that the same great drink quality and food quality is maintained across multiple locations? So certainly, you know, lots of companies have this similar challenge, but it's been interesting to sort of grow as a small business and see this uh, become something that you really have to think a lot about. Yeah. The adage that comes to my mind with the Winnipeg Trolley Company is from, I think it was an episode in the 90s of The Simpsons, you know, where it's like, Winnipeg, we were born here. What's your excuse? And I feel like with the Trolley Company, you're trying to break a little bit of that idea and show people from outside what Winnipeg has to offer, as well as, as you said, people in Winnipeg that do you know your city truly, which I find to be quite interesting. So obviously this show is geared towards kind of understanding that post-COVID-19 world, but we really need to start with an understanding of the current pandemic. I mean, right now we're, we're doing this via Zoom, which is the standard in, in the pandemic space. But insofar as those challenges that you just described, you know, in the pre-pandemic space, how has the pandemic potentially exacerbated those challenges or, or affected how you deliver services to Winnipeggers? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it certainly... I mean, in terms of exacerbating a challenge, if you talk about just lack of accessibility, I mean, they literally 
have more or less closed the, the U.S. border. And we did mm-hmm. get a fair number of folks coming up from Grand Forks and uh, even from Minnesota. So that's certainly been a challenge. And also, too, I mean, just people have been encouraged for much of the last year to not travel. And so even if it was, in, and traditionally, one of our big opportunities is if you have friends and family coming to Winnipeg, whether it's coming for a wedding or just to sort of visit, we oftentimes will really try and capture that market, bring them onto our trailer, say, hey, you should you know, send your friends and family to come see us so they can understand what makes your city so great. And those people also were similarly just not coming either. And then with health restrictions, we really were essentially encouraged by the province to not operate the trolley company uh, this past summer. So our vehicles ran very minimally and we didn't actually run our public tours, uh, but instead we did design a couple uh, walking tours on an app. So you could download a smartphone application and then take sort of small chunks of our bigger tour that you would need a vehicle to access and then sort of walk it. And we added some food suggestions and things like that. So really trying to pivot to something that would be appealing to, you know, locals looking to try and explore their own city because they couldn't travel elsewhere, but then also ensuring that it was something that people felt safe doing, uh, whereas they might not feel safe on a uh, larger transit vehicle. Mm -hmm. And then for Fools and Horses, sort of Similarly, like I said, just you need constant foot traffic to come in. And we have always been a real big believer in the downtown. And in fact, three of our four locations are in the downtown core. And just as in terms of the safety protocols that a lot of businesses implemented, they in fact sent much of their staff home. And Mm -hmm. so as an example, we have uh, one coffee kiosk in an office tower. And uh, just recently they did a survey and normally the office tower has about 1600 people in it, employees. And currently there are 266 people working in the building. So that's a pretty significant drop in customer numbers. And so then sort of thinking about as a business, okay, well, you know, you have a fixed location. What can you do to try and bring people in or when they are in to try and increase their order? So some things we've done, like many, we've started doing online ordering. We're offering a curbside pickup. So we'll run your order out to the curb for people who felt a little bit less safe coming into the cafe. We've been fortunate that we weren't shut down entirely. So we always were able to do a takeout service, but then also too moving to things like So as an example, we have um, some really great syrups and concentrates. We make our own vanilla syrup. We make our own chai latte syrup, chai latte concentrate, I mean. So we've now started to bottle those and say to people, you know, if you're not in your downtown office every day, but you still miss a nice fools and horses drink in the afternoon, a nice chai latte, why not buy this syrup? You can uh, steam your own milk at home just on the stove, and then you can actually make one yourself. So just Mm -hmm. begin trying to pivot to something that makes sense and sort of meets customers where they're at in their lives. It's really interesting to hear the solutions because it it is really kind of changing that customer business relationship and moving the product to, as you said, where they are located. And again, just how you're able to deal with the decline in the foot traffic in that downtown area. I'd like to talk a little bit more about that because you're talking about how three out of four of the Fools and Horses coffee company is in kind of that downtown area. And one of the aspects of this that's been talked about has been kind of, the term is the death of the city center. Some have talked about this, others think it's blown out of proportion. Our first guest, Professor Braille, noted that some are kind of backtracking and saying that when the pandemic's over, the employees will be returning to to their office in the downtown area. But as you said, right now, that's currently not happening. You know, there's a significant decline in people who are not going to downtown and don't necessarily need those downtown services. So I just kind of like to get your thoughts on that notion, because, you know, as a business owner who has businesses in the downtown, who operates trolley company, you know, touring the downtown, what are your thoughts on this notion, the death of the city center? Well, I would say that I'm a general optimist. And so I think that the idea is, I think death is quite a strong word for the situation. I do think there's going to be an evolution of the city center, and I think we're already seeing that. And even the the office workers who I've had the chance to speak with or my staff talk to, they're already talking about even when it, it is sort of safe to come back to work, that'll look different. And so maybe it's rather than five days of the week, they're coming for two to three days of the week. And mm-hmm. maybe they're coming in teams or something like that, or maybe even thinking in a broader way, a lot of conferences that um, a number of office workers say, oh, every year I have to go to Calgary for a big conference on real estate or whatever it is. Now that's moving in line. And so I think a lot of companies are saying, well, why are we spending all this money on flights and hotels to send everyone when we can be doing a, a Zoom conference and sort of getting maybe not the entire experience, certainly because networking is very valuable, but getting a lot of sort of a lot of the value of that conference at a much lower cost. 
But returning to the city center, I do really think that that idea of the death of the city center is overblown. And I do actually think that there is real value to having people, for people having opportunities to meet with one another. And I know that the idea of Zoom fatigue has been talked about ad nauseum, but I do think that really is something that people talk about. And even for us as a coffee shop, we've had a few times where I've been you know, in the shop and seen people just randomly run into each other. And it's like meeting old friends for the, you know, the first time in such a long time. And they're so grateful for that. So I think that one, I encourage just in general, but I think there are going to be sort of a, a broader push for more residential in the downtown area. And then again, I think that what an office looks like in terms of how many times per week a person is in there will change. But I still think that people see real value in going into the office, at least a certain portion of their time. And then again, I think that people see real value in having great meeting places like coffee shops, like restaurants, like parks and, and the like. That's a terrific way to characterize it because I think with death, it sounds kind of binary. It's like zero or one. It's either alive or dead. Whereas you're talking more about an evolution, kind of hitting that, you know, a situation where, again, people are still going to the downtown. It may not be every single day each week, but, you know, there's culture to maintain. There's businesses there that add to a well-rounded lifestyle, I might say. So one of the aspects to this discussion is the role of public transport. You talked about your passion for transport and getting people to see all the great sites of Winnipeg. What's your thoughts on on the role of public transport and access and its future in that post-COVID-19 world? Well, so similarly, I know that right now there is a very significant decline across many parts of the world when it comes to public transit. But I think the simple fact of the matter is that when it comes to moving large numbers of people, public transit is by far the most efficient way to do that. And so Similarly, I think that we'll have to rethink what does public transit look like. And maybe that means sort of saying, you know, certain areas of our city, we need to really focus public transit because these are the areas where it is the most efficient and where it makes the most sense. But Mm -hmm. then running very expensive buses that hardly nobody is on out into suburbs because it's just not a place that makes for where public transit is particularly attractive or feasible. Maybe we have to rethink that model. But I already know that a number of public transit experts, even prior to the pandemic, were talking about that kind of model is incredibly expensive and you really should be sort of focusing on your core or at least having a greater focus, if not completely doing away with suburban routes. And I certainly think that there's going to be a sort of a thought about what does safe public transit look like, but already, I mean, a number of studies that uh, I've read or a few studies have been done on COVID-19 breakouts and sort of the risk of COVID in public transit. And it seems like relatively speaking, the risk is quite low. And sort of when you think about how it's spread through droplets and things like that, If you compare the experience of you sitting by yourself quietly sort of looking at your phone or reading a newspaper on a transit vehicle where nobody's really talking or moving their mouth at all versus being in a loud bar or a restaurant or just even out in other spaces where there is a lot more interaction and a lot more speaking and things like that, it sounds like that is uh, potentially the higher risk. And so I think that transit agencies will want to talk about, you know, safety measures and will have to really think about their messaging. And again, thinking back to How many people are coming into the city every day? How is that going to change? Do you need to have the same sort of rush hour and peak period transit running? Or should it be trying to spread it out throughout your day if you've got more residential in the downtown? Or if you've got people able to come in and commute to work at more flexible hours rather than just sort of the nine to five? So these are certainly questions that will need to be asked. And also, I think that there's a real opportunity that I think we've started to see in terms of active transportation where people, you know, didn't necessarily feel comfortable riding transit but now we're turning to cycling or even just walking to work as a, as a new opportunity. So really starting to think it's not just transit or cars and it's not just transit during the peak period. So asking ourselves, how can we think of all of these different modes and how can they work best together? And then when it comes to transit specifically, asking ourselves, how can we sort of watch how the city itself is evolving and respond to the actual transportation needs of our population going forward? I, I want to switch directions a little bit and talk about innovation. Throughout this pandemic, we've certainly seen a number of innovations come to the forefront. And you've mentioned a few of them already, just in terms of how you as a business are able to kind of meet customers where they are located. The big one being, of course, food service delivery apps. And that plays a large part in mobility as a whole, I would say. So again, our first guest, Professor Braille, stated that businesses, in order to weather this pandemic, will have to increase their, their digital presence. You know, so you've, you've kind of already mentioned, you know, how you've embraced some of these innovations, but I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit more about that, like about how you've embraced these innovations and how do you see these innovations potentially evolving in the post-COVID-19 world? 
So, I mean, with Fools and Horses in, in Winnipeg, at least sort of the big food ordering app is called Skip the Dishes. And it's really, as with in many places, it's really sort of exploded. And we have, um, we've gone on Skip the Dishes and uh, we are certainly glad to be there. But um, these kinds of apps, they're certainly not a perfect solution by any means, because in part, you know, our original menu was designed to be served mostly in-house. And so we suddenly found, oh, it's actually when people order it and, and then a driver comes and picks it up and takes it away, it actually doesn't present as well. And so when the person is actually opening up their dish, suddenly it's, I mean, for instance, we serve toast and a number of times we found that the ingredients had kind of fallen off the toast or the toast had even just flipped while en route. So for us, it was, it's actually more than just sort of embracing the, the technology, but then saying, okay, well, how do our current products no longer, uh, or how do we have to sort of change and evolve our current products to, so that they still present well within the parameters of that technology. So yeah, the food delivery app is really the, the big one for us, but then also we launched an online store. And so you can go to our website and you can purchase, like I said, our concentrates, syrups, coffee, things like that. And so and also, too, we found that having a website that has information on the company is more important than ever in the sense that, I mean, people are now constantly checking, well, when are you open? Have you been closed? What are the safety protocols? And so before, where I think if you visited a lot of third wave coffee shops, their web presence, their website was oftentimes just maybe a single static page. Now they've really started to put a lot more information on there, which I think actually is oftentimes really helpful because people want to know, well, okay, if I'm going into this space now, now, what can I expect, both in terms of protocols, but also, you know, what menu do you have currently available? And so before, again, I think that third wave coffee shops, just everyone's busy. Maybe your web presence is, is not as important as you thought, but really now making sure that you have a robust website that has the information that customers are looking for. And then also, of course, wanting to make sure that it links up to your Skip the Dishes platform if you have it, or that uh, people can purchase in the online store. And then thinking about, again, sort of going back to how the digital influences the in-person interaction, thinking about, okay, well, if somebody's ordering from us, how can we ensure that that's a really smooth experience, that they haven't placed an order as an example, and then we are out of that product because oh, somebody came up and purchased the same item in store. And so now we have to call that person and say, oh, sorry, we're out of it. So I think the digital is very, very helpful. It's a real great way to just simply maintain a connection with your customers. And I think that there are also ways that you, or I should say, it is certainly very helpful, but you do really have to think about how to ensure that you are maintaining great customer service with these new tools at your disposal. It's really interesting because I think on its surface, everyone always talks about the benefits of the digital presence. And that appears to be the case. You're still able to meet the customers where they are. But it was very interesting, as you said, you know, you still have to kind of maintain that the presentation of your product is still keeping with the experience you want to give the customers. And again, if the toast is all messed up and everything, that might dilute that a little bit. If I could just say too, that when it comes to that sort of thing, it's not really reasonable for you as a business to just pass blame or to wash your hands of it and say, oh, well, you know, the driver should have been more careful. Well, because at the end of the day, the customer, they don't really care. And I mean, some customers might say, oh, well, you know, that was, that was the driver. But at the end of the day, if they have a poor experience, whether it was the restaurant's fault or the driver's fault, the bottom line is that customer is going to think twice about ordering your product again, sort of next time they're, they're hungry. Mm -hmm. So really, like I said, you can't pass blame and sometimes it's not even anybody's fault. Um, mm -hmm. So really just, you need to think about how you can maintain that customer service, even though it is in some senses out of your hands afterwards, sort of just making, yeah. That's a helpful characterization. I'd be curious to know, like insofar as these innovations go, what we're seeing is a lot of people talk about how in some cases, you know, innovations can't necessarily translate back or some of them might be sticking for the long haul, you know, the online format, the digital presence. What's your thoughts on this? Are there certain innovations do you see will be lasting with businesses for the foreseeable future in that post COVID-19 world? Or are there any sort of innovations that you say, this is just a temporary thing, you know, once we're back to normal, you know, I'm going to drop this. I mean, I think it's really going to depend on the individual business, the individual business owner and sort of what their needs are and what their realities are. So I know a lot of businesses now have sort of discovered the, the online world and they're saying, well, you know what, if I can have my old customer base plus the sort of additional revenue generated from an online platform, whether it's Skip the Dishes or whether it's just an online store, something like that, they're saying this is just sort of, that'll be additional opportunities on top of my old customer base. And so for those people, I don't think they want to go away from that. And to talk about this sort of pivot over to uh, tours, I mean, tourism has really moved online in an incredible way. 
And so you've got things like Airbnbs, online experiences, as an example, or even just individual companies who on Instagram, on Facebook are doing sort of little mini tours, or they're saying you can book a Zoom call and I'll give you a, you know, there are people out in Pompeii saying, mm-hmm. I'll do a walking tour of Pompeii. You sitting in Winnipeg can now experience that. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that people like to travel and once people can travel safely, and I think they will want to. But the reality is that travel can be very expensive. And so if you can get a really great engaging experience and sort of experience Pompeii with your friends and family sort of gather around for a birthday at 20 bucks a person rather than thousands of dollars for a trip, I think that that's something that is going to stick around. And people view that as a selling point because if you've, I mean, I've taken tours now too online or had different experiences of coffee tastings, wine tasting, stuff like that, where we did it. It was great. And this person sold me. So now I'm thinking if I can ever get to Mexico City, there was a barista who I did a coffee tasting with. And I'm thinking to myself, if I can ever go to Mexico City, I would love to go and check out his coffee shop because he was such a warm person. He told the story of how this coffee shop came about. Mm -hmm. And so again, similarly, that is a marketing tool. Um, It's bringing in some revenue right now. In the long term, it's sort of building a potential customer base. And hopefully sort of going forward, he will have great walk-up traffic in his coffee shop. But also, maybe he can continue these and just add some additional revenue on the side. So that's super cool. I wasn't aware of that. Now I have to kind of see where I'll be traveling uh, maybe this Friday. Yeah, um, totally. uh, so obviously, we're, we're talking about the urban environment as well as just kind of the future of work itself. So, so you're a business owner. During this time, we've seen a real push from the work from home because of the pandemic. How challenging has it been for you trying to manage and coordinate with members of your team from their respective homes? Is this something that you might see continuing to be embraced in the post-COVID-19 world? So given that we are a coffee shop company, we actually... I mean, sort of considered an essential service of frontline workers. So many of our staff are actually still working in the coffee shops. Okay. Managers, where possible, do sort of work from home, doing a lot of their administrative work. But basically, most most of the staff that we have, they are on the floor and so Mm -hmm. actually serving customers. So... For me, I mean, really, the person who stayed home the most in in our companies has has been me, just in the... And so... I miss people and I do a lot of phone calls with my, my staff just so that one less person is in the shop, but I actually haven't, my, so my personal experience and my company's personal experience hasn't actually been one of much of a challenge of the coordination. Although certainly I've heard of, of lots of others that have had that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, fair enough. Fair enough. So we're nearing the end of the interview, but I'd really like your perspective on this just because we're characterizing the urban environment. And it is the case when you're talking about business in a kind of a transactional sense, you know, business clientele and everything, but it also is a community at the end of the day. And we've seen a number of initiatives over this pandemic that, that have been aimed at building up support for local businesses. I'd be curious for your perspective on that. As a business owner, how has the local downtown community supported your business during this time? Well, I would say that um, because the downtown community is oftentimes made up of office workers who live elsewhere, I would say that it really has been a situation of the broader Winnipeg community. And I think many cities have sort of experienced this, but certainly in Winnipeg, the support for sort of buy local campaigns or suddenly starting to really seek out actively local businesses has been just incredible. And so, and sort of going back to talking about the value of online platforms, I mean, you've got a, a platform like Skip the Dishes and we know, we know that we've had a number of people who had not heard of us before, but then went on Skip the Dishes and we're actively trying to find, okay, well, what's a new local place that I can check out mm-hmm. and found us and hopefully we've, uh, you know, created a new sort of long-term customer. And so certainly I think that within the downtown, it has been very pronounced and we've got organizations like the Downtown Winnipeg Biz, which is the sort of local development agency that's doing all kinds of creative promotions and trying to support local businesses. Downtown offices, they've done a lot of things. So for example, around the holiday season, they were buying gift cards for their staff. They were buying even complete meals from us and from others for their staff. So that's been really great. But I think sort of the biggest impact has just been a a sort of citywide push towards let's buy local, let's support local, let's go out and actively seek out local when prior to the pandemic, maybe that wasn't always sort of top of mind for you. So I think that if there's at least one silver lining coming out of the pandemic, that uh, that is definitely one of them. Correct me if I'm wrong, it kind of sounds like, you know, before you had the clientele in the downtown, but now the clientele is just the city of, of Winnipeg, not just the downtown area. Is that is that a fair way to characterize it? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I mean, I think it's too early to say whether we will stay on Skip the Dishes long term, but one of the sort of reasons for staying on a a platform like Skip the Dishes is because even if you don't necessarily work in the downtown, 
ever and you are hungry and you want to get some fools and horses and it wouldn't be convenient for you to walk down or to drive down yourself if we're on skip the dishes and you're out in a suburb somewhere it does become a little bit more realistic and so uh, it does really expand the customer base and even like i said sort of going back to new people have discovered us and maybe they're not sort of coming in every single day because they don't work in the downtown but if they're driving through the downtown on a saturday why not stop at uh, fools and horses and grab their coffee on their on route to somewhere else Ben, this has been a very insightful interview, just in kind of being able to understand, you know, get your perspective, your expertise on how businesses might evolve, how the urban center might evolve. Do you have any concluding thoughts on how Canada's urban landscape or the future of work might evolve in the post-COVID-19 world? I think one of the things that's been exciting about the pandemic is that it's really forced people to get creative and helped us sort of realize that what we were doing prior to the pandemic doesn't have to be what we're doing going forward. Whether that is thinking about, you know, how we build our cities, whether that's thinking about sort of our transportation and even our ecological impact when it comes to things like transportation. So I think suddenly people are actively looking for different ideas, new ideas, wanting to get inspired. And so to me, I think that that's really exciting. And for young urbanists and for people trying to sort of make it in this space or have an impact, I think that in some real, in very real ways, there's never been a better time because citizens are listening and governments even are listening and uh, trying to think about, well, okay, things are changing right now. And when change is already in motion, I would argue that it's easier to sort of get other changes added on to that, especially if you can really inspire people when they're looking for inspiration. So I think, I realize that's a very broad statement, but I think that that is something that Again, going back to if we can find some silver linings out of what was a horrible situation, uh, that might be one of them. Ben, thank you so much for your time. Where can people go to find out more information about your two ventures here? Absolutely. So they can check out uh, winnipegtrolley.ca. And if you just Google Winnipeg Trolley, you'll guaranteed to find it. We're the only trolley in town. And then uh, if you Google Fools and Horses Winnipeg, again, we're the only Fools and Horses in, in this. <laughs> <city. laughs> Terrific. Well, thanks so much, Ben. We, we really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Today, we have been provided with unique perspectives on how the urban environment may evolve in the post-COVID-19 world. This includes how critical features of that environment, such as public transit and downtown business and services, may advance into the future. Cities have changed permanently because of the pandemic. However, the city center is not quote-unquote dead. Rather, as Ben noted, there will be an evolution. Employees may not be in their workplaces five days a week, and some conferences may move entirely online. However, there is still value in people meeting one another face-to-face at your local third space. Additionally, how we conduct business and how businesses reach new and established customers continues to evolve. The online service delivery model is not perfect, but for Ben's businesses, the community is no longer just downtown employees, but the whole of the Winnipeg area, which has been exposed to his businesses during this time. However, that does not mean we should become complacent. A rethink on public transit, on how we prioritize areas based on the principles of equity and efficiency is required. Additionally, discussion is needed over the required investments to see forth effective public transit systems. A district should not be an island, and people should not be left stranded. This pandemic has not been easy. This we know. But as Ben concluded, the pandemic has forced people to get creative with their urban environment. Whether through embracing food service delivery apps, selling your chai latte syrups online, or creating tours for people from all around the world to visit your city virtually, this creativity must continue in the post-COVID-19 world. Thanks for listening to After Immunity. A big thanks to Shauna Braille and Ben Gillies for coming on today's episode. Special thanks to Teo Blumrich for helping out with some of the copy for today's episode. Tune in next time for our last episode as we explore the next pandemic in our post-COVID-19 world. Host and executive producer is myself, Ian T.D. Thompson. Associate producers are Neil Kramer and Jonah Coetzer. After Immunity is a UMFM 101.5 limited series broadcasted out of the University of Manitoba. For more information on the series, visit umfm.com. If you have any thoughts or comments on the series or anything you heard on today's episode, email us at after.immunity at umfm.com.